The following interview was conducted with Jeffrey T. Roberts, Frederick L. Hovde, Dean, College of Science, and Professor of Chemistry for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, March 9, 2011 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Dean Roberts, and thank you. It's a pleasure, Catherine. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and early years. Sure. I was born in 1960 in San Francisco, California. Uh, my father is a pharmacist. My mother was a nurse. Uh, we lived near San Francisco for four or five years. And then uh, when I was five years old, we moved to Santa Rosa, which is about 50 miles north of San Francisco. My father had his own business there, and that's where I grew up. Okay. Tell us about grade school and then uh, the high school. In grade school. You know, I can just remember a few of my teachers, Miss Matoba and Mrs. Jackson, uh, high school. Uh, I went to Santa Rosa Junior High School and Santa Rosa High School. Santa Rosa High School uh, has is very photogenic and has been lots of Hollywood movies like um, uh, American Graffiti. Uh, the teachers that I remember most, although I became a scientist, the teachers that I remember most are not my science or math teachers. I remember uh, Mr. DeSoto, my English teacher, who... Uh, taught me how to write and uh, to be analytical, and uh, he loved literature. I'd never seen anyone love something so much. And Mr. Vonderporten, my history teacher, uh, who wrote a book, and I remember being so impressed by that and learning, thinking about what it, learning about and being exposed to what it meant to be a scholar. So those are the teachers I remember most from Good. high school. Were there any student clubs or organizations that you belonged to at that time? Uh, I was very interested, and still am, I've always uh, had wanderlust, so I've always been interested in travel, so I was uh, involved in the uh, exchange student clubs. In fact, when I was 17, between my junior and senior years of high school, I was an exchange student in Turkey. And oh, so very. that was a lot of fun. Oh. Were you there for the whole year? No, I wasn't, unfortunately. I was there for the summer. But it was a lot of fun living with a Turkish family. And um, and then when I came home, my family had hosted, was hosting an exchange student from Israel. And he stayed with us for half a year, and we still have a, a relationship with him, exchange cards and emails and things like that. Very so. nice. Very good. Um, well, after that, uh, tell us about graduate and professional uh, education. After, after you finished college, what came next? Okay, so I, 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 after high school, I went to college. Uh, yeah. I was a graduate college, student. Right. You, you, I, should I talk about college? Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, uh, my family couldn't afford, and I couldn't afford to go directly to university and it happens that California has a very strong community college system. And so I went to Santa Rosa Junior College for two years. That's in my hometown in Santa Rosa. And uh, from there, I went to UC Berkeley as an undergraduate, majoring in chemistry in the College of Chemistry. And that was a, a really nice couple of years. Um, the professor that I remember there most uh, is Professor Johnston. And he's one of those people, coming back to the Nobel Prize theme, he, he was sort of fourth on the list of people who should have gotten the prize or, uh, for, for ozone depletion chemistry. But he, he, and as it happened, uh, when I became a professor, I was doing some chemistry that was sort of related to that and ran into him. But uh, the thing that was most remarkable about him was that he was my advisor when I was uh, a junior and I just got to Berkeley. And I remember he looked at his, at my record and he, he looks at me and says, well, you look, you look pretty good. You should be thinking, have you thought about graduate school? And having just been, come from a junior college, I, I didn't even know what graduate school was. Sure. And uh, he got me involved in undergraduate research and, and he taught me uh, something really important, which is um, when we talk about mentoring we think about, oftentimes think in terms of long-term relationships. He, he spent maybe five minutes with me, uh, changed the course of my life because he got me to think about graduate school and, and, and sort of pointed me in the right directions, got me in a research lab and, and so on. And I'd, I'm sure he didn't think about it again, uh, but it was a life-changing experience for me. I had the, He has thought about it again because when I run into him, I've told him about it. But oh, he, he was a very... He lucked out. He, just he was of, really he lucky. Got, well, he was just doing his job, and he was doing his job well. Uh, and, um, yeah, it was a, it was very... 
important experience for me. Right. Uh, well, also, in college, did you live on campus then when you were there? I, I did. I lived, on, on I lived on campus, and um, uh, Berkeley is one of five or six universities across the country that has what's called an international house. These were uh, dorms mostly for international students that were built by the Rock- Rockefeller in the 20s, I think. So it was a beautiful old building. Uh, it had this view. There was a window seat where you could go sit and watch the sunset across the Golden Gate Bridge, down the Golden Gate Bridge. But um, so I lived there while I was at Berkeley, and uh, because I love being with foreign students, and right. so that was a great yeah. place for me to Did live. The, and you take your meals there too, as well. Took your meals there, and yeah, yeah it, was a, it was an old-fashioned dorm. When I take my kids to the uh, dining halls here. And I tell them, yeah, you know, you used to get two choices, and they were both bad. <laughs> and so it was an international residence hall, but the food was no different from the dorms. <laughs> oh, okay. After after uh, college, what came next, then, sir? Graduate school. I went right to graduate school, okay. and I was a graduate student at at Harvard University, where I got my PhD. So I started there in 1982, and I left in 1988. Okay. How did you enjoy the Boston area? I loved I loved Boston. You went I from think. one coast to yeah, the other. Yeah. Well, so um, I was always kind of studious in California, and I rem- the joke that I tell people is that when I moved to Boston, when I went to Boston to look at graduate school, I went there for a few days, considering Harvard and MIT, and um, you would see all these people that were kind of pasty skinned with dark circles under their eyes that looked like they'd been in the library all day, and I thought. Yeah, this is my place. Yeah, I know. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's where nerdy bookworms go to study, and so it, it was uh, it was a great place to be. And Boston is a wonderful city to live in, especially when you're young. Lots of things right. for young people to do, and you don't quite um, the incredible expense of living there doesn't bother you quite so much when you're young. That's right, and there's a lot of amenities in the culture. Lots areas. of amenities, cultural things, and and you can find. Good prices and good deals on things. Yeah, yeah. I don't think it's a great place. Once you start to think about raising kids and buying a house, it's not so fun. But it was was great. It was a great place to be a graduate student. That's right. Were were you ever in the military at all? No, I wasn't. Uh, How about your career path before you came to Purdue? Tell us a little about that. Sure. Well, when I finished graduate school, uh, I I went to do a postdoc, and that was in the Department of Chemical Engineering at Stanford University, and I was there for two years. It was very standard. Once, once I was out of uh, uh, junior college, it was a very stereotypical and standard track into academics. So I was a, a postdoc for two years, and uh, then I went on the academic job market, and I accepted a position as an assistant professor at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Chemistry. So I like to say that I bounced back and forth from one close to the other and then rolled to the middle. So uh, I moved there in 1990 as an assistant professor of chemistry and kind of rose up through the ranks. Uh, Spent, I guess, four years as department head, uh, and I left there in a year and a half ago to become dean at Purdue. Right, very nice. Let's talk a little bit about tenure the Frederick L. Hovde Dean and Professor of Chemistry in the College of Science. What about the strategic plan, uh, a little bit about that, and some of your goals and objectives and the things that in the Sure, sure. Um, so the my predecessor did a strategic planning exercise, and that's called Insight, Innovation, and Impact, and it mirrors the university's strategic plan quite well. Uh, there are pillars associated with what the university plan calls discovery with delivery, with meeting global challenges, with launching tomorrow's leaders, and we have a, a fourth pillar that is specifically organized around goals and issues related to faculty and student and staff diversity. Um, The strategic plan that I inherited is one that I endorse and embrace. Uh, The aspects of it that we're working hardest on are uh, interdisciplinary research um, and enhancing the undergraduate student experience. And so something that we're working very hard on and thinking a lot about is uh, when you think, well, one of the associate deans who works with me, the way we like to talk about it is when our students graduate and get their first job and they're sitting around the water cooler or the lunch table or whatever, 
talking to their friends, comparing their educational experiences, what, what things are we able to give them at Purdue that their friends say, gee, I wish, I wish I'd had that, I wish right. I'd gone to Purdue. So it, uh, things like study abroad, um, leadership experiences, um, summer research experiences, and, and we'd like to create an environment and, a, and capacity, which is kind of space for research, but also a financial capacity so that every student can have that experience, those kinds of experiences, because they're, they're, they're formative and they're essential for success. The first year that I was here, I remember there was a week that I went to, you go to a lot of lunches in this job, right. and um, there was, it's getting near the end of the year when there are really a lot of lunches. And there were, what, the same week I went to two lunches that were organized for graduating honor students. But one of the lunches was just for kind of regular honor students. And we were sitting around talking. And they were all describing their study abroad experiences and so on and how important they had been. And the second uh, table was... The second lunch was for, they were honor students, uh, but they were first generation college students. And I was asking them about study abroad and they were almost all saying, you know, I couldn't do that. I needed to go home and work at Culver's or whatever in the right. summer. And, and, and they were um, wonderful students. And it struck me how, this, we talk about accumulated disadvantage. And so this, uh, these, and so, it's been a passion point for me since then to uh, work really hard to make sure that um, we don't just think in terms of scholarships because they just pay tuition, but to find ways to uh, make really compelling experiences for all of our undergraduates. So that's a, a, a huge priority for me right yeah, now. Yeah, that's everybody gets gets an enriching experience that's across right. the board. Yeah, which is really nice, you know. That's right, and uh, you know, so so when we're thinking about how do we help kids who come from uh, families that that can't pay the whole bill, it isn't just enough to make sure that the tuition gets paid. There are other things that we need to fill that's out, right, and that's what we try to do. Yeah. That sounds very good. Um, your research area? Sure, I'm Where have you been able to continue it? I'm trying. In fact, I just hired a postdoc, and he's here this week, and he's, uh, we're getting him settled in because he brought his family, two small kids, from Korea. Uh, I'm uh, what's called a surface chemist, and uh, when I started my academic career at the University of Minnesota, I was very interested in the uh, surface properties of uh, clouds, cloud particles. Uh, at that time, the ozone hole was a, a big, important problem. It still is, but an understanding of it was a, a big, big thing. And it turns out that chemical reactions that happen on cloud particles are instrumental in opening the ozone hole. So we studied that. Um, but more recently, uh, I expanded f doing kind of environmental chemistry, but started to do more materials chemistry as well. I'm sure you've heard about nanotechnology and nanoparticles, and so uh, it's a big issue with nanoparticles. Because they're so small, a very large fraction of the material is actually at the surface of the particle. So understanding the surface of, the, of those particles, right. things that might be useful in devices. And I, I, I cut out the atmospheric stuff when I moved to Purdue because I just don't have the time, and we're working on the materials things now. So I have a lab in, in Brown. Good. Try to get there as often as I can, I know, which true. isn't often enough. It's too hard, I know. All right, Nobel Week in Stockholm. How did you first hear about it? And then take How did I first hear yeah. that, that Dr. Nagishi was yeah. a Nobel laureate? So um, After he got the phone call? or I was after. No, yeah, yeah you don't. I, I think that Dr. Nagishi, will, he may have talked to you about this. He, there are weird phone calls that come in for a couple of weeks before, I think, because they need to confirm. And there have been a couple of high-profile mistakes over, over the time. years oh, where the wrong person that, gets called. I've heard similar incidents. Yeah. Right. Um, but I happened to be traveling, and I was coming back to West Lafayette from uh, a meeting in Boulder, Colorado, and I just turned my rental car in at the Denver airport, and I was on the you know national car rental bus back to the terminal, and I checked my the New York Times on my BlackBerry, 
you know, I'm a scientist, and Nobel Week, I, you know, the, the prizes are announced the same week every year, and I knew that the chemistry prize was coming in, so of course I was looking for that. Sure. And um, I was, uh, uh, you know, delighted to see that, that my, one of my colleagues was, was among the chemistry laureates. So it was uh, a huge surprise, and it was a delight, and I was... Uh, grateful that I was going to be able to get home that day and help celebrate with the campus. Right. And isn't it nice because the other, uh, one of the other co-recipients had been at Purdue at one time, and they were uh, uh, colleagues, correct? That's correct, okay. and uh, both of them did their postdoctoral work right. with Dr. Brown. And in fact, um, if we could go back sure. to my, my own history, I was thinking about that because I remember when Dr. Brown's prize was announced, I was studying sophomore level organic chemistry, and we took a day out of when the prize was announced to talk about that chemistry and to understand the significance. And so, you know, the, the life takes you strange paths. Little did I know that I would one day be at Purdue University where that prize was announced, uh, celebrating with his mentee's prize. Right. So, yeah. Tell us a little about, in your own words, about the uh, Stockholm and, and all went on over there. You, uh, you recall? Yeah. It w it, did you all go? Did you meet over there? We met over oh, there. Well, okay. Dr. Nagishi um, took a long trip to to Stockholm through Japan. The, he went the, there and, first, didn't and he? Mrs. Nagishi, um, you probably know she wore a very special kimono. I you're, heard that. Uh, yeah, you're allowed. Apparently, you're allowed when you, when you you get all these instructions when you're invited to the ceremony. You're allowed. Uh, men have to wear. A white tie, or you can wear your national costume, and ladies as well, of course. And my joke was, does that mean I can wear jeans and a T-shirt? I can wear my national costume, but um, <laughs> I like it. Yeah, <laughs> but but she need she had a kimono made, and they needed to go through Japan to pick up this kimono that had been made for. Her. And they had other things to do. He met sure. the emperor and things like that. So no, I arrived. Uh, the the president and uh, her husband, the first gentleman, were there as well. They got there the day before I did. I I had some issues, th things I needed to see to sure. here. Sure. So um, so you get there and. Um, the kind of the center, the the place where the kind of the, I, you know the the center where where everything starts and ends and where people congregate uh, is the Royal Stockholm Hotel where I did not stay because it was too expensive but you, you I made a beeline there and there's a Nobel desk and um, you think of the prize ceremony and the banquet but. It actually lasts a week, and so you know everybody gets their little stack of invitations depending on uh, what laureate they're associated with and what they've been invited to. So, um, doc, uh, it's a tradition in Stockholm that that the ambassador of the country of citizenship of the laureate hosts a lunch. And Dr. Nagishi is a Japanese citizen, so the Japanese ambassador. Uh, hosted a luncheon for him and his delegation, so there was an invitation to that and so on. Um, it was really fun because, uh, well, first I should would like to say that Dr. Nagishi was uh, incredibly uh, generous in giving in in inviting me to join him and inv inviting the president and and the first gentleman as well as Eric Weddle, the local newspaper reporter. That's right. Um, he was only given 14 tickets to the ceremony and the banquet, which is not very many for someone who's had such a long and distinguished right. career. You, could, I mean, a lot of people would have liked those tickets. And um, so we, so, but he he was even more generous in that uh, there's a very rigid kind of schedule to Nobel Week, and the prizes are always awarded on December 10th. And uh, two days before that, there's always a Nobel concert given by the Stockholm Philharmonic and the uh, Royal Music Hall, which is also where the prizes are awarded two days later. And uh, it, it's very special, and uh, an internationally prominent soloist is always invited. And um, this year it was Joshua Bell, who's, who's a Hoosier. Uh, who was a soloist violinist. But anyway, we were there, and the Nobelists and their delegations, the people who had been invited to the concert, were all in kind of the dress circle level of the concert hall. 
and uh, on either side of the of the royal box. And so I was actually sitting right next to the royal box. And um, was the king and queen were they there? No, the king and queen didn't come, but one of the princesses came. Uh, the she's the sister. I, I had to look her up on the web. She's the sister of the king. So not the not the princess whose photograph you've seen sitting next to Dr. Nagishi, but. Um, the thing that amused me the most is, and you're not going to send this to her, I, I, saw, I looked over in the middle of the concert and I saw her working her Blackberry, which, um, yeah. well, you think, know, she probably goes to these all the time, right? Probably don't want to keep, you know, I've got to keep up to date or whatever, you know. So, so that was a lot, lot of fun. Um, is it a nice facility? It's a beautiful, beautiful lecture hall. It's an old-fashioned place. Again, it's where the prizes are awarded on the 10th. Okay. Uh, that's fun as well. Um, one of the things that I learned is that the Nobel Prizes are a huge point of pride to the country of Sweden, and Nobel Week is something that much of the country looks forward to. Uh, each of the no Nobel laureates uh, is given access to a stretch limousine that week, and it has the Nobel insignia on the side, and you can see them driving around the city, and everybody steps out of the way when they go by. Um, when you go to the concert hall, there's a kind of a, a courtyard in front in front of the concert house, uh, you know, covered with with bricks, and there it's cordoned off. Uh, by the police in the day that uh, the day of the ceremony, and you walk up and and there are sit, you know people just crowded around waiting to see people come in and you know you have to flash your invitation and then they open the cordon up if you have an invitation to let you in so I felt like I was in Hollywood or something right uh, so the ceremony itself is 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 spectacular um, there's a a a, a citation that is read for each of the Nobel laureates, um, and that's re that's written and and read in Swedish. But you're provided with a translation, and uh, after each citation is read, the laureate gets up and shakes the king, shakes the hand of the king, and then is presented with the medal and so on, and sits down. Uh, and after that, uh, the uh, the, after the ceremony is over, then those who have been invited to the banquet afterwards move to the banquet, which is given in the city hall, in a very large arcaded room. Uh, it called, I think the person I was sitting next to said it's called the blue room, and the reason I can't remember whether it's blue or green is that actually it's neither, it's red brick. Apparently when it was built, it was uh, supposed to be painted that color and it wasn't. Um, the banquet is, is, is really amazing. Um, and the, uh, the woman who was sitting next to me, so I was sitting at, the, there's a long table down the center uh, where the royal family and the Nobel laureates and the high-level dignitaries, people like the prime minister, sit. And then there are tables off the side. Off uh, of the main table? Yeah, off the main table. I mean, they're separated, sure. but yeah, where folks like me sat. And, uh, and then around the edges, uh, there are tables where students sit. Apparently, university students can apply to a lottery and be given tickets, oh, get nice. tickets. Yeah, and they wear these kind of sailor hats with ribbons hanging down, and apparently you can tell uh, what university they're associated with. With the ribbons, with like, foot, like the, the college. Yeah, college. yeah. So the person who was sitting next to me, um, her husband is the retired, I don't know whether he was the CEO or the second in command at Volvo, and she told me it was the eighth one of these she'd been to. She was a little blasé about it, saying, oh, yeah, the entertainment's not as good this year as it often is, but the food is better, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, but, but, but the thing that was amazing to me, she was telling me that um, in Sweden, it's this huge thing, and for you know, a couple of months before the banquet, all the morning television shows would have things about uh, who was selected to be the chef this year, uh, who's doing the flowers, and so on. The menu is a huge secret. It's not revealed. Uh, to, it's not re the menu is not revealed to the public until the meal starts to be served at 7 p.m. Uh, on the 10th of December. Then it goes out on the web. She said that there are families across Sweden, 
she said this tradition is kind of dying out, but across Sweden there are families that um, they, they, they get dressed up and they prepare a kind of a fancy meal and they watch the banquet on television because the, it is being televised sure, or cameras sure. going around you all the time. Uh, and, and, you know, people sit down and they, they, they eat, eat, the, eat a fancy meal while they watch the banquet and then there's entertainment associated with the banquet. And um, the flowers, she was telling me, I think this is all available, you know, histories, but uh, the flowers... Uh, come from Italy, and they're they're grown in the garden where Alfred Nobel is buried. So there, there's all these kind a of lot symbolic of traditions. Uh, traditions and symbolic resonances. Uh, you know, she said that there had been a lot. Uh, she told me that there had been a lot of um, discussion in the newspapers about and these shows about the flowers that year. Uh, they were kind of a simple flower arrangement. They were test tubes with um, magnets that were. Uh, glued to the bottom, and then there was another magnet underneath the tablecloth, and so these test tubes kind of just stood up, and then there were flowers in them, but uh, the the florist had created these as an homage to uh, the medicine Nobel laureate, who was a person who developed the technology for test oh, tube babies. So it was, there are all these kinds of things that you don't notice, but that people have thought through very, very carefully. And you were able to learn about it. Oh, them. yeah, that yeah. was a lot of fun. Uh, quick uh, question. Were the metals, are they made uh, in in Sweden, or you don't know? You know, I don't know where they're, they're made. Dr. I know Chica. that yeah, Dr. Nagishi... Now, that it is on a ribbon? Yeah, I oh. think you get actually two of them or something. I don't okay. know the details, but yes, it was on a ribbon. And then they also, there's a, a quite prominent um, Swedish artist who uh, creates a kind of a callig uh, uh, cali you know, calligraphy with, with a, a watercolor painting where the citation for each laureate is written. And they're separate for, e they're different for each laureate. And Wonder they're displayed, what? there's a ball after the banquet, and they were displayed there. Did you go to the ball as well? I did. In fact, it was very embarrassing for me because um, I was I was supposed to escort the lady on my ride up to the ballroom, and then we did the first uh, waltz, and I'm afraid, I, I don't know how to waltz, but I think after... I think being the wife of the CEO of a major industry and having gone to eight of these, she was probably used to people who didn't know how to waltz. But it was Good embarrassing thing. to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, didn't he give a? Did he give a lecture? He did. All of the yeah. laureates give a lecture. Okay. And um, who was invited? To, is it just the one? Those are open. Okay. Anyone can go. Okay. Uh, and they're given at the um, the university. I think those are at the University of Stockholm. Okay. Or the, the Carolins. And um, they're 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 open, so um, undergraduates are general. I mean, you can so imagine if you're can taking go. chemistry, your chemistry professor says you must go right. to the chemistry oh, yeah. lectures. They're quite short; they're 25 minutes each, I think, because uh, each of the laureates needs to give a lecture. So there's a set of a block of time set aside for all the. Uh, physics laureates to get because there okay. were there are up to three in each discipline and then right. a, a block of time set aside for the chemistry laureate. So yeah, that was on. I think those were on Wednesday and the awards were given. Yeah, that was on Wednesday and that night was the concert. Right. Um, for the ceremony, um, do they give? Does he give no talk at the when? No, uh, he just doesn't receives. Speak. He just receives the, okay. the award. Um, at the banquet. Uh, each uh, field that is being recognized, you know, uh, the chemistry, literature, physics, and so on, uh, one laureate from each field is invited to address the banquet uh, at the end of the meal. And uh, Dr. Nagishi was chosen. Uh, I think the laureates themselves decide he was the one who, uh, the chemistry laureate who uh, addressed the banquet hall. That was very nice. Yes. He was very... Um, that was a long day. It was a long day. I, Mrs. Nagishi, I know, was very tired. Um, he was, Dr. Nagishi is a remarkable person, I'm sure you know. Yes, and chatting with him. He, and I think anyone who watched the coverage from West Lafayette of Nobel Week uh, would have remarked on how much fun he, he seemed to be having compared to the other laureates. And my theory is that... Um, the the other laureates that we that were there that, that I heard or or spoke to, 
they all were, you know, very typical in saying, oh, you know, I'm so humbled by this. You know, many other people could have got them. And, and mm -hmm. Dr. Nagishi seemed to be the only one who had the courage to say what he really felt, which was that he'd wanted this for 20 years. And I think yeah. once you can admit that, you can kind of enjoy the party. And yeah. he was really having a good time, and it was a delight to watch. And he's quoted by saying that, and he made yeah. a comment no, he's uh, not in the, embarrassed. during the interview. Uh, I don't think he should be embarrassed No, it. I don't either. But I think it, it gave him the license to have a good time, and That's he right. had a good time. Were there any other special events that uh, was something going on almost every day? Every day. So wow. the, the on the Monday, so there was a, a reception at, that was at the Karolinska Institute, which is um, I've heard a, a research. It's, it's at right. outside of Stockholm. So Dr. Nigishi and his family took the limousine. Most of us took the bus, and uh, you get there, and it's beautiful. You know, you remember it's, it's um, I think it started at 5 o'clock, but it's winter in Sweden, so it's pitch black. Right. And there was snow on the ground. Uh, people were saying it had been a few years since it had been snow on the ground for Nobel Week. And uh, you get pull up to this beautiful old brick building, and um, there were um, luminarias, you know, the candles that they put in bags lining the pathway up to the building, and you go inside and there's a Christmas tree and uh, beautiful old gilt ceilings with portraits of all the former directors of the Karolinska Institute. So that was one night. That's a treat just to be able to see that facility and be there. Oh, it was, a, oh. no, it was, everything was, everything was oh, a treat. Um, yeah. Then, you know, there was the concert one night, that was on Wednesday. Um, no, maybe the was, maybe the concert was on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday there was a reception at the Stockholm Museum, and then on Thursday, Dr. and Mrs. Nagishi hosted a dinner at a restaurant for um, for the, for the the people who'd accompanied them. So there there was something every night, Very oftentimes things in the afternoon. So it was a lot of fun. I thought I was going to have uh, a chance to do some Christmas shopping, but. Um, I didn't have, I, didn't have well I was too busy. The only time that I had, I needed to spend being fitted for my tuxedo. Right. Did you did you just borrow? Did they rent one there? Or there there's a pla there's okay. a place that uh, rents them. Uh, they said the the Nobel people send you all this information, and sure. I, I sent them my um, you know my size and my stuff, measurements. Right. But um, but uh, Chris Foster, the first gentleman, and Eric Weddle. Uh, they were both smarter than me, and they went to Mr. Penguin over in Lafayette, and that's where they got their dress. And they wipes. brought them with they them. They brought right? them with them, and it was a lot cheaper. <laughs> let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. What? Um, where did he, did he come? Uh, then you left what on Saturday? And I left on Saturday. Okay. So the banquet was on Friday, and uh, the one thing I was a little sad about. I needed to get home because it was a Christmas season. I couldn't be away for that long, but. Uh, the banquet ends at, I don't know, midnight or one or two, but then there are a bunch of after parties that the university students give. Okay. But I had to catch a plane at 6 o'clock, so I'm afraid I didn't go to those. But then um, there are other events in Sweden that are just for the laureate that last until Monday or Tuesday. Oh, okay. They needed to go to other places. for. Right. So there are other things that go on, more private kinds of ceremonies and celebrations. As part of that, yeah. Yeah, it's right. all part of the week, yeah. Right, yeah. Um, did you get a chance to uh, interact with him uh, to some? And did you, what about the king and queen? Did you meet them? I did not meet the king and queen. Uh, they, but they were there. They were there at the yeah. banquet, and um, there was a uh, at the rece at the the ball after, sure. after the, the banquet, banquet. There was a kind of separate room where the dignitaries were allowed, and uh, I, you know, I wouldn't have been. There would be no reason why I'd have been let into there. So I didn't meet the king and queen. I saw them. I, I saw Dr. Nagishi a little bit, but uh -huh. I, he, uh, there were many people that were important to him there that week. He was busy, so I, I kind of tried to stay right. in the background and but just be great. grateful for the opportunity oh, to be there. Wonderful. Uh, how was the the meal? Was it pretty good? The dinner? Yeah. So again, the meal yeah. is is um, very special. It, it, it <laughs> is, and I enjoyed it because um, I studied. It's one. Old, it, there are a lot of old fashioned traditions, and one of them is that the menu cards are in French. And I was, at the banquet. At the banquet. Okay. Yes, and I was very proud that um, <laughs> that that I was the only one at my table who could translate the menu, including 
the person sitting across from me, that, who's the president of the University of uh, Gothenburg. Interesting. Yeah. Very nice. So, the, but the menu is nice, and again, it's very secret, and um, it is. Uh, it, 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 it's a, a it's apparently you know the a huge honor. Uh, the work is all given to Swedish. You know the the sure. program that there are songs that are commissioned, and there was a little mini play that was put on. They're all commissioned of Swedish artists or Swedish florists or Swedish chefs, and so. Um, so the first course was a galatine, which is kind of a chunky pate of, of duck. And then there was the second course. It's three courses. I learned this. It's very rigid. There's champagne as well. You have a toast to, the, to Alfred Nobel and a toast to the king. Um, the second course was turbot, which is a fish stuffed with um, truffles and then kind of winter vegetables. And then there was a kind of orangey chocolate um, mousse and then at the ta for dessert and then the table also has um, kind of gold foiled covered round chocolates that uh, have Alfred Nobel's portrait on sure. them and uh, we had a banquet a celebratory banquet for Dr. Nigishi back on campus that was in February and we had hoped that we could get some of those to have but uh, apparently, they are they're trademarked, and they're only allowed to be used for the Nobel banquet. <laughs> you have to go there. You have to go there, and you have to be invited. Unfortunately, <laughs> I don't think you can buy them. <laughs> oh dear. Well, let's talk a little about the uh, Nagishi Brown Institute. Uh, make a comment on that for the researchers. Sure. So, um, I think that uh, for me, one of the most exciting things, uh, aspects of Dr. Nagishi's prize is that it uh, shines a, a, a spotlight on uh, fundamental science at, at Purdue University. Organic chemistry, the kind of work that he did, does the way I like to describe it is he's working to develop new tools in the toolkit for people who want to make molecules. So it's very fundamental and very basic. And um, when we talk about uh, discovery with delivery at Purdue University has been an important part of the strategic plan. That that means pushing our inventions out the door, right. but it's the folks who are working on problems like those that Dr. Nagishi works on, doing the fundamental stuff that are really growing the seed corn that is taking Good us point. to the point where we can push things out the door. And uh, Purdue is a wonderful place. and. Uh, we have celebrated and enabled interdisciplinary scholarship and translational scholarship, the kinds of things that move, move products and ideas out the door. But we've maybe, um, I wouldn't say we've stopped paying attention, but, but maybe don't pay enough attention to the people who are doing things at the beginning. So mm -hmm. one of the uh, purposes of the Nagishi Brown Institute is to really focus institutional attention on one area of fundamental science, that would be synthetic organic chemistry, and uh, to uh, strengthen it and to make it better and to create the kind of uh, intellectual environment that we need to make the third to, to, to enable the third Nobel right. Prize at Purdue. So it really is about um, honoring Dr. Nagishi, honoring Dr. Brown, that tradition is so right. important, uh, but also helping to elevate uh, basic science at, at, at Purdue. Uh, but I, I, I guess I should say the, the Nagishi Brown connection is also important. I don't know, Catherine, if you've seen that. There's a very, to me, moving photograph of Dr. Nagishi taken. Uh, the day that he uh, received, w learned that he's a laureate of paying his respects at Dr. Brown's grave. And um, yes. it, it, it's very moving right. and it speaks to, you know, at, at Purdue we value uh, tradition and respect and continuity. And to me, this, um, the Nagi the, this Nagishi Brown connection is just a supremely moving. 
distillation of, right. of these values that we hold so dear here. Nicely said. I agree with you. That's very, good. very nice indeed. Uh, you're going to get it'll get started. Um, it, it's you know, Doctor Nagishi needs to be in town so we can sit down and. and I'll he, mention that when no, I have lunch no, no. With him. He has some he has some ideas about sure. how 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 to move forward. I, I can tell you some of the things that are going to be very important are um, yeah, researchers. Will appreciate yeah, researchers, this. Uh, collaborations uh, with industry. Uh, that those can be really, really important and valuable for students. So bringing scientists oh, yeah. from in industry in to work for Purdue for a while. There will be an international component beginning uh, for obvious reasons with Japan, but also just really refocusing our attention and redoubling our efforts to make basic science as good as we can at Purdue. Oh, that sounds good. How about uh, some hobbies? Uh, hobbies. Still the, are you still a uh, history buff? Then that trip uh, helps. Um, well, yeah, I like to cook. That's what I like to do. And okay. uh, I've always liked, many chemists like to cook. Uh, in fact, it's funny, I was at a, um, when I was at the department head at, at the University of Minnesota, I used to host a dinner every year that I called Kitchen Chemistry, and we would invite friends of the department and things. And I would write little cards that explained why this custard was thick and why <laughs> fruit gets juicy when you mix it with, with sugar and things like that. A few weeks ago, I had a dinner in California with some alumni. One of the first alumni that I, Purdue alumni that I, I met, uh, started to get, you know, form a friendship with here. We, share, we discovered a shared interest in cooking. And we've been working since I got here to organize an Iron Chef competition. And we did that. We had that a few weeks ago. That was fun. She won, though. I lost. So, <laughs> so I, I like to, to, I like to cook. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Uh, the, now, the impact of the Nagishi and the Nobel Prize on Purdue in the, the field of science, especially chemistry, uh, and the overall effect on K-12 students and college graduates. Yes. A couple comments on that. So... Of which I, some of you have mentioned. Uh, yeah, I, I think that um, one of the great things about Dr. Nagishi's prize, and it, it's, this effect is most profound in his home department, chemistry, but I think it spreads across Purdue, is that uh, this is a difficult time in higher ed, and it's kind of a sa sour mood in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and it gives us something to smile about and to be optimistic about and to remember that even though we're having to cut budgets all the time and reorganize this and reallocate that, that the fundamentals are still there, that right. we're still moving forward and making progress. So I, I think that it's impossible to uh, understate the importance of this prize for just creating a sense of enthusiasm and optimism at, at Purdue. And again, most profound, obviously, in the chemistry department, but it but spreads it all over campus. Right. Um, we all know the story, and it's a very moving story, that, um, that Dr. Nagishi needed to cut his press conference short uh, the day that the prize was announced because he had to get back into the lecture hall. So... I think that this is a really uh, nice thing to help Hoosier kids to reinforce to them the importance of science and to get them excited about science. Um, I think that's going to happen. I was at a, but I will say that I, I was at a dinner a couple of weeks ago to honor Dr. Nagishi given by the, I believe it's called the Indiana Japan Society. It was down in Indy. And uh, there were a lot of Japanese kids there, and they were all asking Dr. Nagishi for his autograph. I wish we could generate, generally in this country, maybe one-tenth of the admiration and the enthusiasm that, um, yeah. that we have for athletic accomplishments, for instance, for scholarly accomplishments. But I, I think the fact that we have that at Purdue, at Laureate at Purdue, is going to help people remember why science is so important. Right. Uh, if I, you know, when you talk to the folks in the chemistry department, some basic things like the number of uh, inquiries from potential graduate students goes up when. So right. we can harness that momentum in important right. ways. I agree. Yeah. Very, and it's just sort of nice. And he's very warm. Yeah. And outgoing, and then you reflected on that in, in many of the comments when you were talking about being over there. And he appreciates, and he really is just very nice. Well, he's a great role model as yes. well. I mean, if you start to talk to him, he is very open about some time, you know, when he was a young student, he faced some 
challenges, some health challenges. He was right. kind of lazy, more interested in girls and tennis than he was in science for mm -hmm. a while. So, and I think it's very uh, important for people to tell those stories right. uh, to folks who are just thinking about their careers. We um, have a stereotype of scientists in this country of being very directed, very focused. Um, I think that I was talking to this about someone uh, in a completely different context yesterday to some, some of my colleagues in the Department of Math about how um, social science is as a discipline, that to be successful you need to convince other people that your ideas are good ones, you need to network, you know, you need to bop yeah. around and, and, and also the, the immense pleasure that someone like I, and, and it's a huge privilege that when you're in the sciences for a while, uh, wherever you go, whatever big city you go to, there's somebody that you know who you can share a meal with. It's a very, very social enterprise. And, and I think that um, if, if more students understood that, they would, that it, it's, it's, you're not just stuck into a lab right. by yourself for 60 years doing nothing, but you're intent, very in deep ways interacting with other people. They would be more interested in science, and I think Dr. Nagishi shows very shows important. that you know, right, that and it's it'll replicate, and yeah. I think it'll 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 come so big it's things. A, it's a powerful message by example. That's right. Very good. Uh, I, anything that I forgot to ask, or anything I don't closing? Think so uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank oh, you very thank much. you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dean Rose. Really it was nice. fun. <laughs>